part four of the good soldier a selection of soldiers letters nineteen fourteen nineteen eighteen edited by n p dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain robert hertz those could hardly have remembered masada who thought that the jews of the allied nations would not rally with enthusiasm to fight against an enemy threatening to introduce once more race rule in the world it was after jerusalem had fallen nearly two thousand years ago and masada was still resisting that the brave eleazar summoned the people to the public square and said let us die unenslaved it was voted that every man should be the executioner of his own family and every man was and in turn they killed one another drawing lots until at last only one man was left to fall upon his own sword when the roman advanced into the city they found two women and five children who had concealed themselves in a cave one of the most moving letters of the war is written by robert hertz socialist and a son of a german jew living in and passionately loving france and her free institutions he fights as he writes to his wife that their son may hold his head high and walk erect with a firm tread and equal among free men because he will be able to tell that his father fought and died in the great war for freedom letter of robert hertz dear i recall my dreams when i was quite small and later when a student in the little room close to the kitchen in the avenue de lama with all my being i wanted to be a frenchman and to be regarded worthy of being a frenchman and to prove that i was and i dreamed of shining deeds of war against wilhelm then this desire for integration took another form for my socialism was beginning to play a large part now the old boyish dream is born again in me stronger than ever i am grateful to my superiors who accept me as a subordinate to the men whom i am proud to command these the children of a people truly elect yes i am filled with gratitude towards the country that accepts me and makes my life complete nothing will be too much to pay for that and that my little son may always walk with his head high and in the restored france not now the torment that poisoned many hours of our childhood and youth am i a frenchman do i deserve to be one no little chap you will have a country and you will be able to walk the earth with a firm tread strong in the assurance my papa was there and he has given all to france for my part if i have need of any it is this thought that is the sweetest recompense there was in the situation of the jews especially the german jews newly emigrated something dark and irregular clandestine and bastard i regard this war as an occasion happily come to regularize the situation for us and for our children afterwards they can labor if they like in work above and international but first it is necessary to show by acts that one is not below a national ideal decorated when one of america's most illustrious citizens an ex-president no less received word that his son fighting with the allied armies had received the war cross it is told that he laughed aloud not altogether for joy and pride as we must believe but at the thought of his tall son being kissed on both cheeks by a french general the anglo-saxon in the matter of embraces is a good deal like the small boy in the berry play who wondered how in the deuce he was going to prevent his father from kissing him upon his return from a long absence in india and finally hit upon the ingenious device of asking his father if he did not want to see the morning paper and thrusting it out in front of him as a sort of bulwark the following letter is written by a young french seminarist who was decorated and kissed by general joffre letter of abbe g decorated in spite of the bad weather thursday was a beautiful day for me i was at chalons to receive the medaille militaire from the hands of general joffre there were about fifty of us to be decorated the generalissimo had a kind word for each one before decorating him 
you are young to have the medaille militaire sergeant he said to me twenty-three years old my general twenty-three do you know i had to wait until i was sixty-three to get it are you pleased with it i am proud of it my general i also and after this brief dialogue a big hug with two great smacking kisses how to tell you how i felt when the big moustaches of the general rubbed my cheeks i do not know at such a moment you no longer live agree that there is something very affecting for a young man of twenty-three to be embraced by this grand old man for a sergeant to be decorated by a generalissimo i thought for a minute that the joy and pride would turn my head it is true that i needed only to look around me to be convinced that i am no great thing more than the others who should have received it and deserve to receive it alan seeger alan seeger is the young american whose poems with rupert brooks are among the precious things coming out of the war the first entry in his diary which his father found after his death in france is dated september twenty seventh nineteen fourteen and reads fifth sunday since enlistment this shows that alan seeger wasted no time he wrote to his mother i hope you see the thing as i do and think that i have done well in doing my share for the side that i think right he entered the war with the lightest of light hearts and expected to return alan seeger was killed in the attack on the baloy en santerre on july fourth nineteen sixteen the last sight of him is described by a friend i caught sight of seeger and called to him making a sign with my hand he answered with a smile how pale he was his tall silhouette stood out on the green of the cornfield he was the tallest man in his section his head erect and pride in his eye i saw him running forward with bayonet fixed soon he disappeared and that was the last time i saw my friend there are bright and vivid descriptions of scene and mood in alan seeger's letters since he was a poet but it is the spirit of the good soldier willing to fight for what he thinks is right that gives to them their fine value one of the letters is already famous it belongs with the great letters of the world with lincoln's to the mother who lost her sons in the civil war it belongs in the archives not of a family alone but of a whole proud people many boys after reading it must have been moved to join young seeger's company with as he expressed it the elite of the world alan seeger's letter to his mother Manier, june eighteenth nineteen fifteen received your letters and clippings yesterday on the march i am not thinking of anything else but the business in hand and if i write it is only to divert the tedium of the trenches and to get a little intellectual exercise of which one stands so much in need now you must not be anxious about my not coming back the chances are about ten to one that i will but if i should not you must be proud like a spartan mother and feel that it is your contribution to the triumph of the cause whose righteousness you feel so keenly everybody should take part in this struggle which is to have so decisive an effect not only on the nations engaged but on all humanity there should be no neutrals but every one should bear some part of the burden if so large a part should fall to your share you would be in so far superior to other women and should be correspondingly proud there would be nothing to regret for i could not have done otherwise than what i did and i think i could not have done better death is nothing terrible after all it may mean something more wonderful than life it cannot possibly mean anything worse to the good soldier so do not be unhappy but no matter what happens walk with your head high and glory in your large share of whatever credit the world may give me dixon scott lieutenant dixon scott like rupert brooke died on the gallipoli expedition he was thirty-three years old and had already been recognized as a sound critic and an excellent writer 
since his death some of his articles contributed to various publications have been collected and are an eloquent confession of loss the list of gifted young english writers poets novelists and others sacrificed to the war is painfully long it is not pleasant to think of brilliant young minds blotted out before they had hardly begun to throw their light but dixon scott has left testimony that he made the sacrifice gladly for posterity's sake a paper he wrote on rupert brooke has become one of the memorable things that have been written about the war the poem is prefaced by brooke's sonnet the soldier letter of dixon scott if i should die think only this of me that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever england there shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed a dust whom england bore shaped made aware gave once her flowers to love her ways to roam a body of england's breathing english air washed by the rivers blessed by sons of home and think this heart all evil shed away a pulse in the eternal mind no less gives somewhere back the thoughts by england given her sights and sounds dreams happy as her day and laughter learnt of friends and gentleness in hearts at peace under an english heaven the soldier by rupert brooke and these fourteen bars of beautiful melody somehow managed to cage more completely than ever before one of the dimmest and deepest one of the most active and most elusive of all the many mixed motives beliefs longings ideals which make those of us who have flung aside everything in order to fight still glad and gratified that we took the course we did there do come moments i must admit when doubts descend on one dismally when one's soldiering seems nothing but a contemptible vanity indulged in largely to keep the respect of lookers-on and of course cowardice of that sort a small pinch of it anyway did help to make most of us brave there was the love of adventure too the longing to be in the great scrum the romantic appeal of the neighing steed and the shrill trump all the glamour and illusion of the violent thing that has figured forever in books paintings and tales as the supreme earthly adventure but beneath all these impulses like a tide below waves there lies also a world of much deeper emotion it is a love of peace really a delight in fairness and faith an inherited joy in all the traditional graces of life and in all the beauty that has been graced by affection it is an emotion an impulse for which the word patriotism is a term far too simple it is an impulse defined precisely without suppression blur or excess in the flowing lines i have quoted one fights for the sake of happiness for one's own happiness first of all certain that did one not fight one would be miserable forever and then in the second place for the quiet solace and pride of those others spiritual and mental sons of ours if not actually physical the men of our race who will depend for so much of their dignity upon the doings of the generation before war is a boastful beastly business but if we don't plunge into it now we lower the whole pitch of posterity's life leave them with only some dusty relics of racial honor to enter into this material hell now is to win for our successors a kind of immaterial heaven there will be an ease and splendor in their attitude towards life which a peaceful hand would now destroy it is for the sake of that spiritual ease and enrichment of life that we fling everything aside now to learn to deal death ferdinand belmont i met an old man at stow on the wold who shook and shivered as though with cold and he said to me six sons i had and each was a tall and a lively lad but all of them went to france with the guns they went together my six tall sons wilfred gibton 
ferdinand belmont called a crusader of france was a young french doctor who asked to serve in the ranks he was rapidly promoted to a captaincy received the cross of the legion of honor and was three times cited in army orders he was twenty-four years old when he was killed in action three brothers of the young captain called in succession have also been killed and the youngest brother is now serving his letters written to his parents are distinguished among the war letters by their spiritual quality their philosophy and piety and also filial devotion perhaps to-day a little old-fashioned and provincial except in france to illustrate the quality of the letters and the character of the writer henri Berdeau tells the story of the old savoyard peasant who when the news came of the death of his second son said god found him ready and went on with his ploughing the young captain discusses the war with the clear detachment that is especially characteristic of the french the war is horrible but to be gone through with he draws the same distinction between the germans and the french as babus in his novel under fire and says the germans are soldiers while the french are men but it is the simple absolute religious faith of the letters that gives to them their special value this is revealed in every letter the writer seems to have only two ideas one to do his duty the other to trust god not the kaiser's particular friend but the good god who is the god of everyone one may recall with some amusement that in eighteen seventy bismarck's wife sent to him a bible fearing he would not be able to find one in france and marked psalms one six the way of the ungodly shall perish letter of ferdinand belmont ah we have just spent a few more hard days i have had two companies and one of them my own to send into action under difficult and painful conditions the business is now over and i must thank god it did not end worse i often think that this agitated life full of emotions is very enviable and that it responds admirably to the proud ambitions of young men who would do and see everything those who feverishly demand to live their life according to the common and fatal phrase it is true i believe that of all this if we survive it we shall retain an enchanted and almost voluptuous recollection i am sure that those who evacuated from the front move towards the rear must quickly experience a feeling of dullness and mediocrity and regret what they have left behind but this also may be an illusion for every life is beautiful and precious when well employed it is not imposed events not the frame which forms the value of an existence but the soul which reacts and adapts itself to exterior conditions life is to be measured by man's capacity circumstances in themselves signify nothing we ourselves give them their color why therefore say we are atoning for the inertia of preceding generations in this immense crucible the world time and space are melted into this infinitely complex mechanism this intricate chemical process we are thrown atom against atom what will come out of the whirlwind god alone knows but what does the knowledge of these elements so diverse and so complex matter to us for god is there let us be in his hand like matter in that of the artist each stroke with the chisel gradually rough hues and refines us rids us of our original coverings and brings us towards perfection ah if we only knew how to let ourselves be chiselled by our maker our crime the crime of ignorance is that we know not how to commit ourselves to him it is as though the block of marble revolted against the sculptor what reflections the emotions of these days of war would inspire if the days most fraught with emotions were not precisely those on which you possess the least freedom of mind it is better so however for action alone can save us from ourselves your letters have been as they always are a great comfort to me therefore how i should love to merit your great affection and do something really meritorious in proof of my gratitude but that debt i shall never pay 
may god aid me to do my duty with docility and humbleness until the time he has fixed humility the great and strong and beautiful virtue one young man the one young man of the letters collected by j e hodder williams in england is called sidney baxter although this is not his real name he is described as being or as having been a drab unheroic london clerk pale and spectacled and droop-shouldered of the kind wells likes to portray sidney baxter was in fact the last man any one would expect to be a soldier when the war came at first he did not associate himself with it at all it was entirely out of his world in his office he was called gig lamps because of his glasses he did not know one end of a gun from another nor the smell of powder from cologne he knew nothing of sports of any kind until he joined the y m c a and became an enthusiastic member of that organization he had a mother dependent upon him well now you know the kind but sidney baxter went to the war perhaps he did not mirthfully hasten but it did not take him long to understand that here was a case for individual responsibility and his mother said she would manage somehow after nearly two years of fighting he was wounded in nine places at the first battle of the somme mr williams in his introduction to the letters says he is as i write waiting for a glass eye he has a silver plate where part of his frontal bone used to be is minus one whole finger and the best part of a second he is deep scarred from his eyelid to his hair i can tell you he looks as if he had been through it well he has the letter this one young man wrote to his employer telling of his blighty and his return to england is said to be treasured as the pluckiest piece of writing that has ever reached this office letter of one young man july fourth nineteen sixteen have unfortunately fallen victim to the hun shell in the last attack i am not sure to what extent i am damaged the wounds are the right eye side of face and left hand they hope to save my eye and i have only lost one finger in hand i will write again sir when i arrive in england at present am near dieppe alexander douglas gillespie books flowers birds children cats kittens it seems as if everything except war were in the letters of douglas gillespie a scotchman to be guessed by his name his trench garden is his joy he sends home for nasturtium seed he wanders knee-deep in mud after violets he transfers flowers although it seems a pity from the gardens of the ruined villages to his trench where others have written about the mud and the rats and the cooties this young scotchman writes about madonna lilies as for the mud he quoted one of his highlanders that's the way a lot me parritch weel thickened there were two gillespie brothers and both went to the war at winchester and later at oxford one had taken all the honors in sports apparently and the other in scholarship douglas gillespie according to high authority was one of the most distinguished men of his generation the brother was killed in the first fighting in the pursuit at the marne douglas gillespie was killed in september nineteen fifteen leading the charge of his men in the face of a terrific fire near la basse he was the only officer to reach the german trench where he was seen to fall he was twenty-six douglas gillespie was one of the many young britishers who apparently entered the war with no hate for anyone he wrote soon after the news from belgrade i don't want to fight the germans for i respect them but if the country is drawn in i feel i must go in too and do the best i can but things soon happen which change his respect into horror and make him eager to go through with it war at the best is a bloody business he writes and it is only by sticking to the few rules that men have agreed to keep that we can prevent ourselves from descending lower than the beasts fighting like the two devils in the inferno who fell back into the lake of pitch biting and tearing one another with their nails he is soon convinced that the traditions of all the centuries behind us are at stake and there must be no failure 
for if we fail we shall curse ourselves in bitterness every year that we live and our children will despise our memory in his own case there was not much chance for failure he writes to his father when a man is fighting in a war like this the news is always good if his spirit does not fail and that i hope will never happen to your son in the last letter written just before the attack in which he lost his life he finds support in the thought that so many of his friends who have fallen in the months before will charge in spirit by his side his brother tom rupert brooke g l chessman the historian arthur heath young gladstone fortunate because he can give a name as well as a life for the cause he believes in balfour marion crawford the novelist's son are some of the names appearing in the letters with the methodical footnote killed in action letter of douglas gillespie trenches september twenty four nineteen fifteen my dear daddy before long i think we shall be in the thick of it for if we do attack my company will be one of those in front and i am likely to lead it not because i have been especially chosen for that but because someone must lead and i have been with the company longest i have no forebodings for i feel that so many of my friends will charge by my side and if a man's spirit may wander back at all especially to the places where he is needed most then tom himself will be here to help me and give me courage and resource and that cool head which will be needed most of all to make the attack a success for i know it is just as bad to run into danger as to hang back when we should push on it will be a great fight and even when i think of you i would not wish to be out of this you remember wordsworth's happy warrior who if he be called upon to face some awful moment to which heaven has joined great issues good or bad for humankind is happy as a lover and is attired with sudden brightness like a man inspired well i never could be all that a happy warrior should be but it will please you to know that i am very happy and whatever happens you will remember that well anything one writes at a time like this seems futile because the tongue of man can't say all that he feels but i thought i would send this scribble with my love to you and mother end of part four part five of the good soldier a selection of soldiers letters nineteen fourteen nineteen eighteen edited by n p dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain harry butters harry butters r f a was a california boy who enlisted with the english army at the beginning of the war and was killed in the fighting on the somme at the age of twenty-four like victor chapman he was one of fortune's favorites he was wealthy and good-looking not since rupert brooke have men and women written about any one with so much admiration and affection radiant dazzling fascinating are words used to describe him he could drive any kind of a car and was sure he could master a flying machine in a week he was an expert polo player and was all that these things imply he went to school in england and yet it is said that it was not because of loyalty to england but belief in a cause in regard to the right of which he never wavered that determined him to enter the war he believed that the joker as he said in the german deck of cards was going to be the little word right he hoped that his own country would enter the war and if it did he would like to get in a few licks under the stars and stripes he had no doubts as to the ultimate outcome of the war although he seemed to have a clear realization of what was ahead of the allied armies he believed in a decisive military victory over the enemy and was impatient with the premature talk of peace the last thing in the world he wants to do he says is to die but in one of his last letters containing instructions what to write to his sister he says please reiterate to her how much my heart was in this great cause and how much more than willing i am to give my life to it say all the nice things you can about me but and this is underscored no lies 
in an appreciation of the life and letters of harry butters mr j l garvin editor of the london observer has picked out the one particularly choice letter and it was not hard to choose no letter of the war has reached a greater height of understanding and faith and high purpose it is a remarkable letter for a boy of twenty-three to write and puts some of the rest of us not so clear-eyed to shame mr garvin calls it a magnificent letter and says it will serve on both sides of the atlantic as the confession of faith of an american citizen in the great war especially the phrase honourable advancement of my own soul mr garvin thinks is one that should live the letter was written after the big offensive of september nineteen fifteen letter of harry butters france september nineteen fifteen and now just a word to reassure you my dearest folks and to lessen if possible your anxiety on my account i am now no longer untried two weeks action in a great battle is to my credit and if my faith in the wisdom of my course or my enthusiasm for the cause had been due to fail it would have done so during that time i find myself a soldier among millions of others in the great allied armies fighting for all i believe to be right and civilized and humane against a power which is evil and which threatens the existence of all the rights we prize and the freedom we enjoy although some of you in california as yet fail to realize it it may seem to you that for me this is all quite uncalled for that it can only mean the supreme sacrifice for nothing or some of the best years of my life wasted but i tell you that not only am i willing to give my life to this enterprise for that is comparatively easy except when i think of you but that i firmly believe if i live through it to spend a useful lifetime with you that never will i have an opportunity to win so much honourable advancement for my own soul or to do so much for the cause of the world's progress as i have here daily defending the liberty that mankind has so far gained for himself against the attack of an enemy who would deprive us of it and set the world back some centuries if he could have his way i think less of myself than i did less of the heights of personal success that i aspired to climb and more of the service that each of us must render in payment for the right to live and by virtue of which only can we progress yes my dearest folks we are indeed doing the world's work over here and i am in it to the finish delenda est germania is our faith for god for liberty for honour the call that so many have answered if not all from as far as i back me up all of you my dearest and nearest and write to me often to show that you do always and forever most devotedly h a b a temporary gentleman in the first months of the war after mons the germans used to say that all the officers of the contemptible little british army had been killed and they would not be able to produce any more this probably explains why an english soldier signs his letters a temporary gentleman his belief apparently being that even a temporary british officer and a temporary english gentleman like himself who was an auctioneer's clerk before the war came and made him an aristocrat are more than a match for the goose-stepping germans in a kaiser's prussian guard this temporary gentleman is the son of a widow in brixton he had a small sister at fifteen he left school and mounted a stool in the office of an auctioneer and real estate agent in his first letter written from france he says i wonder if i ever should have seen it had there been no war well that in a way explains him the most travelling done in his family is an annual two weeks vacation at a seaside village they were enjoying such a vacation when the war came and spoiled it it was annoying vacations are brief and precious but it was not long before the auctioneer's clerk had enlisted and a little family in brixton was entitled to a service flag with one star and i used to think he writes from the trenches that the pattern of my neckties made a difference to our auctions when he is finally wounded he catalogues himself in the language of the auction room 
one full-size extra-heavy temporary officer and gentleman right arm and left leg slightly chipped the whole a little shop-worn but otherwise as new will be sold absolutely without reserve to make room for new stock he adds they have to keep as many beds as possible vacant in clearing stations you know of the many tributes paid to the british tommy the temporary gentleman's is one of the finest and the most sincere he says the english soldier is the same color all the way through and this color he seems to think is the true blue of the genuine aristocrat letter of temporary gentleman and with it all mind you they're so english i mean they are kind right through to their bones good fellows you know sportsmen every one of them fellows you'd trust to look after your mother they're as keen as mustard to get to the strafing of the boches but that's because the boche is the enemy war is war and duty is duty you couldn't make haters of them not if you paid em all ambassadorial salaries to cultivate a scowl and sing hymns of hate not them not all the powers of germany and austria could make baby killers women slayers and church destroyers of these chaps of ours if i know anything about it they are fine soldiers but the kaiser himself kaiser they call him wouldn't make brutes and bullies of em warm their blood and mind you you can do it easily enough even with a football in a muddy field when they've been on carrying fatigues all day and by jove there's plenty of devil in em god help the men in front of em when they've bayonets fixed but withal they're english sportsmen all the time and a french child can empty their pockets and their haversacks by the shedding of a few tears norman prince at the time of the visit of the french envoys to this country at a meeting in boston at which frederick h prince was chairman the eloquent m viviani said i salute that young hero norman prince who has died having fought not only for france but for america because we have the same ideals of right and liberty norman prince was the founder of the escadrille americaine later the famous lafayette flying squadron that has so chivalrously and nobly paid its country's debt to france for lafayette and rochambeau only two of the original squadron at this writing still live one thinks of these young aviators who immediately upon the outbreak of the war volunteered their services to france as not unlike the emblematic winged figures seen in many paintings leading the armies well on ahead and pointing the way norman prince was educated abroad and at groton and harvard after being graduated with honors from the academic course at harvard he attended the law school he went to chicago to begin the practice of his profession but was greatly interested in flying and spent much time with the wright brothers he played polo and hunted and was keenly interested in every kind of sport when the accident occurred which resulted in his death and both his legs were broken he told the surgeons to be sure and not get one of his legs longer than the other because as his french mechanic wrote to his parents il fait c'est beaucoup le sport it was after an aerial raid on a german munitions center that norman prince died from a skull fracture he was returning from the battle in the air and was trying to make a landing in the dark when his machine struck a cable stretched above the trees both his legs were broken the skull fracture was discovered two days later he was not yet thirty he won the croix de guerre the medaille militaire and the croix de la légion d'honneur his letters are slight but show great devotion to the cause of the allies and especially to france and to his friends of the lafayette squadron letter of norman prince june twenty sixth nineteen sixteen dear mamma poor victor chapman he had been missing for a week and we knew there was only a very remote chance that he was a prisoner he was of tremendous assistance to me in getting together the escadrille his heart was in it to make ours as good as any at the front victor was brave as a lion and sometimes he was almost too courageous attacking german machines whenever and wherever he saw them regardless of the chances against him i have written to mr chapman a rather difficult letter to write to a heartbroken father 
Victor was killed while attacking an aeroplane that was coming against Luftberry and me. Another unaccounted for German came up and brought Victor down while he was endeavoring to protect us. A glorious death, face à l'ennemi, and for a great cause and to save a friend. Your affectionate son, Norman. Victor Chapman it is curious how quickly some names become legendary and they are suddenly associated with everything that is beautiful and heroic rupert brooke the poet had no sooner died on the gallipoli expedition than a whole fund of story grew up about his name which has become at once as familiar and as remotely unreal as that of some fabled knight or hero the same is true in hardly less degree of alan seeger the american poet in the foreign legion who was killed in france and of victor chapman the young american aviator who was killed at verdun it is easy enough to say that the legend grows out of youth or beauty or genius or wealth or even death which alone transfigures but the legend to persist as it does with some names must have started with truth the name of victor chapman deserves to be legendary and his story to be told and retold as are the stories of heroes since it embodies the best of america he was one of the fortunate youth he was graduated from harvard in nineteen thirteen he was studying at the beaux-arts in paris when the war broke out he said he guessed he would enlist he enrolled with the foreign legion the first month of the war he was a year in the trenches and fretted at the inactivity he wished he was in aviation in one letter he has a plain grouch he is sure that he will be transferred to the aviation just before this company goes into action and makes a brilliant attack or that the war will end just before i get my license and go to the front with the american escadrille but luck as he would have called it favored him after a brief training he at last is able to be doing something actively for france instead of just toying with her expensive utensils he was killed at verdun on june twenty three nineteen sixteen and fell within the german lines he was twenty six the story of how he met his death plunging headlong to the rescue of his companions suddenly attacked by the german machines and how he was carrying in his own machine a basket of oranges for a friend in the hospital has already been told many times and has become one of the legends if the character can be read in personal letters victor chapman would have been the first to smile if not to grumble at being called a hero nothing could be imagined more modest and direct and simple and furthest removed from noble than he reveals himself in his letters not written for a large and admiring public since they are not the right kind of thing he chaffs at the idea of the family worrying about him he has the honest boy's abhorrence of a fuss instead of telling his people to be brave when they worry about him he flatly tells them not to take the edge off from his own complete contentment in doing for the first time in his life something worth while letter of victor chapman halloween nineteen fifteen i get the idea that you and alice especially are wearing yourselves out worrying and praying about the danger i am in or were rather when i was at the front and will again when i return it's all very parental and i appreciate it but i wish you would not because it rather takes the edge off and principally because it does not benefit me or any one this is the first thing i have ever done that has been worth while or may ever do and you might just as well get the benefit of it without the heart-wringing worry why not take the good and leave the bad it is easier to pilot an aeroplane than drive an auto when you get on and far less dangerous than the autoing i used to do daily at cambridge this flying is much too romantic to be real modern war with all its horrors there is something so unreal and fairy-like about it which ought to be told by poets as jason's voyage was or that greek chap who wandered about the gulf of corinth and had giants try to put him in beds that were too small for him every one says that they get tired of flying it's too monotonous 
i don't see it but on the contrary an infinite variety is this when there is a slight sprinkling of clouds clouds are not thin pieces of blotting paper but liquid ceaselessly changing stream i played hide-and-seek in and out them yesterday sometimes flat blankets like melting snow on either side below me or again like great ice floes with distant bergs looming up and open water near at hand blue as a moonstone cloud floating full for all the world like gigantic jellyfish those that have red trailers and a sting in the nearer pools the mottled earth piebald with sun and shadow showed through and it was thanks to these i knew my whereabouts i was going from below the clouds to above them circling in some hole thus i realized the size and thickness of the walls three hundred meters sheer from top to base of dazzling whiteness some have many feathery filmy points and angles others are rounded and voluminous with cracks and caverns in them these are all the fair-weather fleecy clouds for there are the lower flatter misty ones and the speckled or mare's tail clouds above which one never reaches there are such a lot of trumpet-shaped and wind-blown clouds this evening that i should like to go out and examine them but it's a bore for my mechanic and i doubt if i could go high enough to warrant crossing the lines your loving victor alfred eugene casalis under the wide and starry sky dig the grave and let me lie glad did i live and gladly die and i laid me down with a will robert louis stevenson's requiem alfred eugene casalis was born on february twenty fourth eighteen ninety six in south africa where his parents were missionaries he himself intended to follow in their career and when the war came was in the theological seminary at montauban in france he was eighteen he immediately began to search himself most seriously for a boy of his years to discover whether he has a heart vibrating enough to fight for others and not merely to save his own skin whether he is quite decided to be a champion of right of justice and of liberty he says it is all very well to be a pacifist but under some circumstances nothing can hold one back he does not wait for his class of nineteen sixteen to be called on january seventh nineteen fifteen he writes i am a soldier of my own free will he describes how he looks in a dirty and ragged uniform with a coat much too big for him as the french soldiers coats were likely to be especially in the early days of the war his letters are full of france of the france of tomorrow the divine france that is bound to be he is willing to die for this france he asks for stevenson's requiem which he says he would like to translate like stevenson this french boy also wrote prayers he was in the general offensive at artois in may nineteen fifteen and was killed in a bayonet charge a boy full of tender thoughts and piety he was nineteen when he fell on the field of honor letter of alfred eugene casalis for me the military life has simplified everything things have taken on their true values and full significance some difficulties which seemed insurmountable have disappeared intellectual sacrifices which i thought i could never accept have taken place almost of themselves without a pang and there results a new vitality a desire for intense action and then there is always peace however i fear this peace both for myself and for those i love because too often it is only human by this i mean that it is weakness and resignation in place of being the full consciousness of a positive duty and a real force and i often pray as follows for myself and for those i love lord our god our loving father stir up our souls in order that they may be not like stagnant waters do not permit us to sleep in a cowardly security in a lifeless calm believing that it is peace on the other hand give our hearts the power to suffer intensely in communion with all grief to revolt against all injustice 
to be thrilled by the appeal of every noble and holy cause lord our christ thy son suffered he wept over the death of his friend he wept over thy rebellious people he wept over his work which threatened to end with his earthly life but he lived so intensely and humanly that he was able to say to us men i am the life lord make our hearts alive then will the peace descend upon them not as the snow which numbs and freezes but as the warmth of the sun which revives the sap in the very veins of the earth o lord may thy peace be with us thy peace and not the peace of men amen r a l canadian stretcher bearer and gentlemen in england now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhood cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us upon st crispin's day henry v the interesting thing about the letters of a canadian stretcher-bearer r a l are the author's own honest and changing reactions to the war at first he is very sure he was not intended to be a soldier but he seems to realize that somehow or other he has got to go and join the elite of the world when the boys return he is afraid it will not be good for the chaps who stayed at home the time comes when he is sure he will not want any of the stay-at-homes around his house he writes this to his young wife to whom the letters are addressed and he adds my god to think i nearly forbore to wear the khaki he begins by doing orderly work in one of the base hospitals his work as an orderly is not exactly pretty can you see me doing it he asked adding with pride and doing it right he says any one who would kick at having to wait on and work for those fellows after what they have gone through isn't worth much finally he cannot wait for the draft to come to him but goes to meet it the list is full but they take off one man and put him on he is in the battle at vimy ridge it was the biggest day of my life he was ahead of the tanks the tanks were too slow for this canadian each brigade went over the top of the other he wonders what canada thinks now our splendid canadians indeed the day after the battle he writes to his wife it is a wonderful day easter monday everybody so smiling and happy alan seeger said that after the war there would be only two kinds of men those who had been at verdun and those who had not the canadian would doubtless add and vimy ridge his letters are natural and spontaneous slangy and boyish manifestly honest and without heroics he says modern warfare is not heroic anyway and he even doubts if war ever was letter of r a l canadian stretcher-bearer the war is so different in any other war we might talk of our noble cause the clash of arms death or glory and all that kind of thing but this one is so vast that one wee atom of a man so small the chance for individuality coming out so remote that it has developed for a single unit into merely a job of work to be done eat sleep and work you don't fight you can't call dodging shells machine-gun bullets and bombs fighting it's fighting all right when you go over but a single battalion doesn't go over so very often even at the somme i wish i could make you get the atmosphere heroics are dead here a charge is not the wonderful glorious thing we were told it was i have even begun to wonder if it ever was or if the poets and historians and press agents of those days have been just kidding us no one wants to go into the trenches yet no one who is any one would dodge out of it every one wants a soft blighty wound with the chance of getting to where there are no whiz bangs and you go to bed every night every man i have spoken to german french english canuck are sick to death of it yet to quit without a definite decision is out of the question and no one would think of it and how on earth am i to tell you not to worry and all that how on earth is a husband like me to write to a wife like you about his feelings on and before going into the front line of a war like this none of us are heroes 
to read of our splendid canadians makes me ill we are just fed up longing for the end but seldom mentioning it and hoping when we think of it that when we do get it it will be an easy one or something final our main effort is to think and talk as little of the war as possible the mail is far the most important thing the next what's the job today of course newspapers are anxiously bought up but we know the newspapers don't tell us much and the thing is so big anyway that no one can possibly grasp even a fraction of it there is one new thing i've learned and that is that it won't be good for a chap who stayed at home when the boys return the thing is just a bit too serious End of part five. Part six of the Good Soldier: A Selection of Soldiers' Letters, 1914-1918, edited by N. P. Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My little nephew, the woman author of Some Letters from France, has a number of brothers in the war and no less than thirty-six cousins, but it is my little nephew who catches the imagination. He stands out heroic stands out in a way it may be guessed that this young gentleman would greatly approve and enjoy conrad's uncle mr nicholas b who was with napoleon and ate the lithuanian dog is hardly a more gallant figure than this french boy he is a direct descendant from d'artagnan to get to the front he had to run away from home and conceal himself in a military train he was only sixteen and a half in one of the letters we learn that the little nephew has been wounded in both feet he will not be crippled he says he is sure but he is very much vexed to be wounded and of course he would be in one of the first letters to his aunt he wrote letter from my little nephew everything here is extraordinary and made especially to please me over there the bullets whistle the shells hum and burst they fire off guns and we cry out some rough language to the boches who are entrenched twenty meters in front of us from time to time an aeroplane flies over our heads the cannon bombard it and the machine guns attack it you can imagine how i amuse myself jean rival jean rival was a grenoble boy the son of a college professor he was nineteen when he fell on the field of honor he was leading his section in an attack and fell dead with a bullet in his head it was raval who led his men to the attack with the cry forward boys with the bayonet for the french women our sisters he lies buried in alsace the alsace of which he writes land of alsace that i love as dearly as my own dauphine like so many young frenchmen and youth everywhere jean rival was in love with life but he was more in love with france in a letter written to a relative he says to tell his parents that he died facing the enemy and protecting france with my breast nor does he want to be pitied he tells his friends not to say poor jean in speaking of him he tells them to say dear jean or brave jean or even little jean but not poor jean he does not want to be pitied for doing his duty with the rest of his comrades maysfield the poet has said of france if all the men of france are killed the women of france will remain if the women of france are killed the children of france will remain and if the children of france must die the dead of france will rise again the story is told that one young french officer in a desperate moment when all had fallen around him cried arise ye dead men and the wounded struggled to their feet letter of jean rival i feel within me such an intensity of life such a need of loving and being loved of expanding of breathing deeply and freely that i cannot believe that death will touch me nevertheless i well know that the role of commander of a company is extremely perilous to lead men to battle is to elect oneself to be shot many have fallen many will still fall i have just heard of the death of several of my friends who only recently arrived at the front as aspirants 
if this should happen to me i count on you my dear j to console my parents you will tell them that i died facing the enemy protecting france with my breast and that it is not in vain that they brought me to my twentieth year since they have given one defender to france tell them that my blood has not been shed in vain and that the many and painful sacrifices of individual lives will save the life of france leslie bushwell happy are all free peoples too strong to be dispossessed but blessed are those among nations who dare to be strong for the rest before america entered the war the american ambulance field service in france together with those who joined the foreign legation represented the country's conscience ambulance number ten is a single record which could be multiplied many times of the devoted service of young america to france the driver of ambulance number ten was leslie bushwell a young harvard student who has received the coveted croix de guerre the simplicity and genuineness of these letters the eagerness of the writer to be of service his sympathy for the fighting men his bewilderment at the war and horror of its cruelties all make them memorable an example of his earnestness is seen in the letter describing a dinner in the trenches on the french fete day of july fourteen when he was asked to sing the american national anthem and got up and did so as loud and as heartily as i knew how ambulance number ten operated in the neighborhood of the much fought over bois la pretre and carried about seven thousand five hundred wounded a month steady driving considering the capacity of the little cars in one letter the author writes i carried over forty wounded yesterday a distance of one hundred and sixty kilos and in another letter he says letter of leslie buswell it was a sad trip for me a boy of about nineteen had been hit in the chest and half his side had gone très pressé they told me and as we lifted him into the car by a little brick house that was a mass of shell holes he raised his sad tired eyes to mine and tried a brave smile i went down the hill as carefully as i could and very slowly but when i arrived at the hospital i found i had been driving a hearse and not an ambulance it made me feel pretty bad the memory of that faint smile which was to prove the last effort of some dearly beloved youth all the poor fellows look at us with the same expression of appreciation and thanks and when they are unloaded it is a common thing to see a soldier probably suffering the pain of the damned make an effort to take the hand of the american helper i tell you tears are pretty near sometimes william york stevenson one of the heroes of the war is the little car it has become endowed with a kind of personality all the ambulance drivers write affectionately of their fliver their tin lizzie their henry as they variously call it in the foreign legion every man is supposed to have a comrade de combat who always goes with him into action the little car is the ambulance driver's comrade de combat the little car has been decorated with a croix de guerre when the famous section one of the american ambulance service was to receive the croix de guerre the french general bestowing the decoration announced that since the section had no regimental standard he would decorate the car it was a fliver says william york stevenson just a plain fliver the after overhang of which gave the outfit the graceful aspect of an overfed june bug the croix de guerre is in the top corner of the flag an eagle is in the center there are three stars indicating the number of times the section has been sighted and there are the names ypres dunkerque somme verdun argon Aisne, a proud record for the little car william york stevenson of philadelphia drove the famous ambulance number no. ten in nineteen fifteen on the somme and at verdun this is one of the ten first american ambulances of the american field service the gift of a new york woman in nineteen fifteen and driven by leslie bushwell in that year at pont a mousson ambulance number no. ten is no longer in the service it is invalided mr stevenson thinks it should not be permitted to end in a scrap heap 
but should be preserved in a museum mr stevenson was financial editor of a philadelphia newspaper when early in nineteen sixteen he went to france and volunteered in the ambulance service he has been in command of the celebrated section one and has himself received the croix de guerre he says when he first went to france the deeper and more serious aspects of the war did not particularly appeal to him but later on he writes france gets a sort of grip on you and one begins to want to stay and see it through letter of william york stevenson for history's hushed before them and legend flames afresh verdun the name of thunder is written on their flesh lawrence binion july two nineteen sixteen the germans made an attack near vaux and our tir de barrage stopped it we drove past some one hundred guns seventy fives and one o fives whose muzzles project over the road and when they fire as we pass in an incessant tir rapide the noise is enough to break the eardrums i stuff cotton in my ears and keep my mouth open the sheets of flame come half across the road and the concussion has even broken some of the windows in the cars the tir de barrage is alone worth crossing the ocean to see a solid line of flame several kilometers long crowned by exploding shrapnel and all kinds of colored lights and flares and a noise so deafening as to make one's head reel and one's brain stop working there were eleven hundred guns working just as fast as they could about twenty-five shots a minute for an hour in the space of about two square miles no words of mine can do justice to that tir de barrage across the etain road i have been scared in my life but never like that the german incomers one regards as luck one hears the warning whistle and thinks it's coming right at one and it falls one hundred yards away again one hears the whistle and regards it as distant and she blows up right beside one there's a cheerful uncertainty that means bad luck if one's hit but when obliged to drive in front within twenty feet of those seventy-fives and others with the flame apparently surrounding you and unable to hear or think for the stunning noise you don't know whether the motor is going and you also wonder where the wads are going they alone are enough to kill a man you also hope the gunners are on their job as some new recruit might aim a foot too low then occasionally a badly timed shot bursts at the muzzle which means exactly above the car believe me i'd rather take a chance with the erratic germ incomers than to have to pass that often if i get out of this without being permanently deaf i'll be lucky camion letters no picture of the great war has appealed more to the imagination and given a better idea of its gigantic operations than the unending procession of the huge army trucks crawling like a mammoth caterpillar over muddy deeply rutted and continually shell-swept roads traveling at night without lights and carrying night and day munitions and food and other supplies to the army the transport service has been called the backbone of the army if this is so it is interesting to know that some american college men have been a very important part of this backbone the first american flag authorized to be borne in the war was carried by a unit of college men most of them from cornell university in the first transport section of the american field service in france with the exception of the aviators the college men were the first armed american force in europe they originally volunteered for the ambulance service but when they arrived in france instead of the little cars they were asked to drive the big five-ton munition trucks instead which the french call camion although it was not unlike agreeing to buy a thrift stamp and being asked to subscribe to a liberty bond instead almost without exception the men willingly agreed to the transfer and regarded it only as that bit more expressed by one of them who when writing home of his promotion said i want you to know how lucky i am and that so far i've done my duty and that bit more which counted the general feeling appears to have been that anything that france wanted had to be done 
after my experience with the submarine one of the boys writes and learning practically at first hand the enemy that not only france but the united states has to deal with and seeing the tremendous sacrifice going on about me without quailing i feel that any sacrifice of personal desires that i make is infinitely trivial although most of the camion drivers are very young young enough to have an inordinate appetite for chocolate apparently and a great desire for a mouth organ the issues of the war are clear to them one of the most serious of the camion letters expresses an abhorrence of war equal to the most unyielding pacifists but this is the very simple and not at all complex reason why he is glad that his country is in the struggle which it is hoped will end militarism and its evils forever the writer of the letter is r a browning of cornell camion letter paris may sixth nineteen seventeen what has impressed me most during my short stay here is the earnestness of the french people in the present conflict their willingness to sacrifice everything for the great cause which they have been upholding since the beginning of the war it is indeed a great consolation to me now more so than i ever imagined it would be to know that the united states is at last a participant in this awful affair it is indeed a miserable affair and a pity that the whole world should be required to turn from the ordinary pursuits of life and peace to those of war but for a long time a war against oppression crime and frightfulness has been waged for us and we have reaped the benefits in money thank god we can now lift up our heads and square our shoulders again the stars and stripes again mean what it meant in seventy six and twelve and sixty one it stands for honor and peace and humanity even though the price be war i long for the day when our first american troops land in france to fight shoulder to shoulder with the rest of the world against selfishness and greed and when this war is over as i pray it soon will be may america my country take the initiative in the movement for an alliance of nations a world federation so organized that war will no longer be possible do not think that mine is a schoolboy patriotism i despise a fight as such i despise war as such we the united states are fighting against war not for it a french mrs bigsby mrs bigsby was the mother of five sons who as lincoln wrote in his treasured letter died gloriously on the field of battle there is a french mother however who having already lost eight sons in the war sent forth the last her letter should become as famous as lincoln's the boy's sisters wrote the letter to him at their mother's dictation like the old woman in the sing play it would seem that with all her sons gone this french woman too might at last sleep a nights letter of a french mrs bigsby i hear that charles and lucien were killed on the twenty eighth of august eugene is seriously wounded as for louis and jean they are dead also rose is missing mamma weeps she says for you to be brave and to go to avenge them i hope your chief will not refuse to let you do this jean had the legion of honor succeed him they have all been taken from us out of eleven who went to the war eight are dead my dear brother do your duty one only asks this of you god has given your life to you and he has the right to take it back it is mamma who says this thy sisters a little mother Hélène Pailleur is the name of the writer of the following letter. She is fifteen. Her father, until he joined the colors, was a forestry guard in the neighborhood of Réon. Hélène became separated from her mother and was alone with her little sister, aged seven, and her brother, aged five, in the storm center of a great battle. It was a month before the mother was able to rejoin the little family, but how it managed is told in the letter letter of a little mother forestry house of cinnamon near saint bob monsieur i am trying to answer your letter which i have received with pleasure i may tell you that we are all home 
mamma from whom we were separated in the battle of august twenty five returned on september twenty one she had been as far as soutenay as for me i went as far as saint barbe with her there i remained a day and a night until the german troops arrived we carried off our best linen and our cow when saint barbe was burned they insisted upon letting the cow burn too and would not let me save it i was alone with rita and robert for an hour during which time they never stopped crying you could not hear each other because of the noise of the cannon and the bullets the germans wanted to keep me from going through but finally permitted me on account of the children i reached baccarat on the other side of the forest but a battle starts up and i fall on the ground from fear of the bullets i keep on going in spite of the refusal of the germans i reached la chapelle when a big battle broke out beyond Thierville. i went on all the same i arrived at the house and found it completely looted i immediately started in to clean it in order to be able to stay in it i had nothing to eat but finally the prussians returned to get their dinner at our house and made us eat with them they had our other cow killed it was a nuisance for our cow was in the stable and the horse was hidden in the ditch at the end of the road it was necessary for me to hide all that in being cross-examined by the officers they took our rye and our corn which was not yet cut they forbade me to bring it in they took all our underwear for their wounded and we have nothing to put on rita and robert are going barefoot they took all our potatoes and i had nothing to say i was anxious because i did not know where mamma was all is sad at this time for us because we have to work hard with no pay it is three months since i have seen a sou finally if i told you all i should never be done we have had news of papa and he tells us that he is well but he does not tell us where he is mamma saw him as jicourt when he left for the north as for the little hunting lodge nothing is left but the fireplace the windows are broken and there are many german graves all about we have still some bedding but happily because we hid it in the forest with a feather bed the forestry house is burned also that of miklo and of marshal our little dog has disappeared and we do not know what was his end jean giraudoux nothing was too good for a french soldier in those first thrilling days in august nineteen fourteen when mulhose not mulhausen was in the headlines and the french flew towards the lost provinces like homing pigeons in front of every doorstep stood pails of wine and sweet drinks and baskets of food there were flowers for every man and gun the doors of the houses stood wide open even at the back so you could see right through writes lieutenant jean giraudoux it was a time of great joy and great emotion the little children adore us and cry vive la france in a throaty fashion as if it hurt but it is to the french women who made a living hedge all along the line of route to whom their gallant countryman pays an interesting tribute letter of jean giraudoux o oh, french women of the railway stations how you all are remembered all along our route at every stop of the train absolutely belonging to us the slaves of each one of us running from the railroad track to the town that was downhill to fill twenty canteens which were empty when they took them and weighed twenty kilos on their return that was uphill not able to keep from giving two pieces of chocolate to every man instead of one and in despair at having twice run out too soon of their supply bourgeois peasants little girls with their english governesses radiant freed since yesterday of a frightful doubt in regard to england all passing in and out of our lives as people in the lives of famous travellers the teacher every one of whose pupils had written and signed a little letter of good cheer for the soldiers the butcher's wife whose stock was sold out who thought suddenly of her jams and flew to her cupboards dark young girls thin devoured by the war at a mining station who changed for us the first five-franc note 
this french money that they have had planned to keep always as a souvenir the shy cousins who noiselessly half opened the door of our silent car about two o'clock in the morning and trembled with joy to see it suddenly awake jump out on the graveled platform bury in knapsacks the chocolate of which they proudly named the brand because it was so dark fair statue with a golden head who scrutinized and recognized each face and refused to give me a second glass of wine when i stood in the line again the wife who looked on at the others without helping under the shining acacias helpless in her grief yet who wanted to see us and at first refused to tell us whether because of her agony or fear her husband's regiment and sobbing aloud when it was at last confessed a living hedge of women right up to the frontier all within a few yards of us except the young girl of monceau who would never come near rising above the track of the train rising above their own lives above their own modesty ready also to die and defying the fast express yvonne x if there are any who feel horror at the thought of young french boys charging with fixed bayonets and shouting forward forward with the bayonets for the french women our sisters they should read the story of yvonne x yvonne was one of the many thousands of girls deported from lille to do agricultural work for the germans consistent with their eminent frankness and fairness the germans announced the deportations in advance the inhabitants of lille were warned not to leave their homes between eight o'clock in the evening and six in the morning the shameful work was appropriately to be done in the dark the people were told to prepare their baggage of linen and blankets and kitchen utensils weighing so many pounds and finally they were benevolently advised to obey orders and remain calm yvonne x was one of the forty-eight of the six thousand young women deported from lille whom the german government finally charitably permitted to return to their homes after the whole world had risen in horror at the abominable thing that had been done she kept a diary which was printed in the revue des deux mondes some of it is hardly quotable after travelling in cattle cars and arriving at their destination the girls were not immediately turned into the fields to do the alleged necessary planting on the contrary some of the girls the better looking ones were taken before medical officers stripped and vilely inspected when they protested against the work that they then learned was to be assigned to them they were told again to be calm and not make a fuss since they were all french and all alike those who were put to work in the fields were lashed when they halted in their labors they were starved yvonne's story of how the germans in their methodical selection of those who were to be deported street by street finally halted before her own door is dramatic letter of yvonne x at four o'clock i awoke with a start they were ringing at the door of our neighbors mamma with whom i share a room jumped out of bed here they are mamma had scarcely said the words when under our windows we heard the noise of boots and the tap-tap of rifle butts on the pavement our bell rang furiously shall we refuse to open impossible by order of the military government one must always open to germans if one refuses there is punishment or prison my mother goes downstairs she finds herself confronted by seven soldiers madame how many persons live here three myself my two daughters a soldier consults the list of people in the house that has to be posted in every corridor show them madame but before mamma was able to prevent him the boche enters my room i was still in bed the man asks me are you mademoiselle genevieve yvonne corrects mamma mademoiselle get up the officer will be here in five minutes the five minutes are hardly passed when the officer arrives ten men accompany him with fixed bayonets you have twenty minutes to get ready the twenty minutes are barely up when the soldiers rifle butts are heard in the vestibule and they shout up in a loud voice mademoiselle hurry up hurry up it is time to go mamma blesses me be brave my child try to comfort those around you 
we kissed each other and parted without tears end of part six part seven of the good soldier a selection of soldiers letters nineteen fourteen nineteen eighteen edited by n p dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain charles peggy charles peggy was the idol of young france for many years he was the editor of les cahiers de la quinzaine a unique publication in paris printing literary political and documentary works as separate books in the cahiers originally appeared romain roland's long serial novel jean christophe peggy was also a poet he was the son of a working man and the grandson of peasants and his faithfulness to the soil of his ancestors pierre de la noue says was like france's herself maurice Perez says of peggy that his whole life was an assault on the german positions peggy went gaily off to the war as a lieutenant of reserve with his section of infantry he was killed at the battle of the marne and thus is named with those heroes who in september nineteen fourteen saved paris and france and perhaps the world for a lieutenant he was a chic type one of his men said of him he had no fear his death as described by one of his men is cited in france as an example of how her heroes die the death of charles peggy the young and clear voice of lieutenant peggy directs the fire he is standing behind us courageous under the shower of shrapnel cadenced to the infernal tap-tap of the prussian machine-guns this terrible race through the oats has taken our breath away sweat drowns us and our brave lieutenant is in the same predicament a brief moment of respite then his voice trumpets to us advance ah this time it is no laughing matter climbing the slopes and lying flat on the ground bent double in order to offer less target to the bullets we rush to the attack the terrible harvest continues frightful the song of death hums around us the hundred meters are thus made but to go further for the moment it is madness a general massacre not more than ten of us will survive captain guerin and the other lieutenant m de cognier are killed dead lie down cries peggy and fire freely but he himself remains standing field glasses in his hand directing our fire heroic in the inferno we shoot like madmen black with powder the gun burning the fingers at each moment there are cries groans significant death rattles dear friends fell at my side how many are dead one counts no longer peggy is always standing in spite of our cries to lie down glorious madman in his bravery the most of us no longer have any sandbags lost at the time of the retreat and a bag at this time is a precious shelter and the voice of the lieutenant keeps on crying shoot shoot for god's sake some complain we have no bags lieutenant we shall all be killed that doesn't matter neither have i any bag do you see keep on firing and he stands up as if to defy the shrapnel seeming to summon the death that he glorified in his verse at the same time a murderous bullet crashes the head of this hero shatters his noble and beautiful countenance he fell without a cry having had in the recoil of the barbarians the ultimate vision of a near victory and when one hundred meters farther on i take a wild look back i see down there a black spot in the midst of so many others stretched lifeless on the warm and dusty ground the body of this hero of our dear lieutenant lewis keen lewis keen is another of those canadians one of the thirty five hundred canadian volunteers who enlisted in the first days of the war and were in england before the germans could say their equivalent for jack robinson lewis keen is an artist he was sketching with his father in canada when he was sent for by a toronto paper to return to make war cartoons 
but it was not long before he was over there and the captain of a machine-gun section and as we must believe an artist at that job too in a description of no man's land he quotes from the diary of a german soldier killed at hooge in august nineteen fifteen he wonderingly says of the german he was writing his diary at the same time i was writing mine they were both in the sharp fighting around the salient at ypres letter of louis keen a trip to no man's land is an excursion you never forget it varies in width and horrors my impression was similar to what i should feel being on broadway without my clothes a naked feeling forty-seven and one-half inches are necessary to stop a bullet and it's nice to have that amount of dirt between you and the enemy's bullets the dead lie out in between the lines or hang up on the wire they don't look pretty after they have been out some time it's a pleasant job to have to get their identification discs and we have to search the enemy dead for papers and even buttons so that we can know what unit is in front of us i managed to get a diary kept by a german soldier who fell on the field it gives the point of view of a man in the trenches on the other side of the line he was writing his diary at the same time i was writing mine july seventeenth march to new quarters we have got a new captain he wants to see the company so at eight a m drill in pouring rain four times we have to lie on our belly and get wet through and through all the men grumbling and cursing at eleven we are dismissed i with a bad cold and a headache i wish this soldiering were over august fourth at every shot the dugouts sway to and fro like a weathercock this life we have to stick to for months one needs nerves of steel and iron now i must crawl into a hole as trunks and branches of trees fly in our trench like spray august sixth the smoke and thirst are enough to drive one mad our cooker doesn't come up the hundred and twenty-six give us bread and coffee from the little they have if only it would stop we get direct hits one after another and lie in a sort of dead end cut off from all communication what a feeling to be thinking every second when i shall get it blank has just fallen the third man in the platoon since eight the fire has been unceasing the earth shakes and we with it will god ever bring us out of this fire i have said the lord's prayer and am resigned captain gilbert nobbs in a preface to a book describing his war experiences captain gilbert nobbs a plucky britisher says this is my first book it is also my last he is blind captain nobbs was five weeks on the firing line for four weeks he was mourned as dead and later received a bill from his solicitor for services regarding the death of captain nobbs three months he was a prisoner of war in germany the british captain was leading his men in a charge when catastrophe overwhelmed him he was yelling to his men get ready to charge they are running come on come on he jumped out of the shell hole and his men followed he was hit in the head the bullet emerged through the center of his right eye the optic nerve of the other eye was affected he was blind at the same time he says he did not lose consciousness but he had an odd experience in which he went down into the valley and came back call it an hallucination a trick of the brain or what we will captain nobbs merely records the incident his own belief he says he will keep to himself but whatever it was for him there is no longer any mystery about death nor does he dread it he insists that he does not deplore the loss of his sight and that he can say in all sincerity that he was never happier in his life his head may be bloody but it is unbowed and he is alive letter of captain gilbert nobbs even the loss of god's great gift of sight ceases to become a burden or affliction in comparison with the indescribable joy of life snatched from death 
there are men and we know them by the score who are constantly looking out on life through the darkened windows of a dissatisfied existence whose conscience is an enemy to their own happiness who look only on the dark side of life made darker by their own disposition such men and you can pick them out by their looks and expression who build an artificial wall of trouble to shut out the natural paradise of existence these men who juggle with the joy of life until they feel they would sooner be dead do not know and do not realize the meaning of life and death with which they trifle let us think only of the glory of life not of the trivial penalties which may be demanded of us in payment and which we are so apt to magnify until we wonder whether the great gift of life is really worth while let us not think of our disadvantages but of those great gifts which we are fortunate enough to possess let us school ourselves to a high sense of gratitude for the gifts we possess and even an affliction becomes easy to bear here i am thirty-six years of age in the pride of health strength and energy and suddenly struck blind and what are my feelings even such a seeming catastrophe does not appall me i can no longer drive run or follow any of the vigorous sports the love for which is so persistent in healthy manhood i shall miss all these things yet i am not depressed am i not better off after all than he who was born blind with the loss of my sight i have become imbued with the gift of appreciation what is my inconvenience compared with the affliction of being sightless from birth for thirty-six years i had become accustomed to sights of the world and now though blind i can walk in the garden on a sunny day and my imagination can see it and take in the picture i can talk to my friends knowing what they look like and by their conversation read the expression on their faces i can hear the traffic of a busy thoroughfare and my mind will recognize the scene i can even go to the play hear the jokes and listen to the songs and music and understand what is going on without experiencing that feeling of mystery and wonder which must be the lot of him who has always been blind and the greatest gift of all my sense of gratitude that after having passed through death i am alive wounded monsieur maurus barres who since the beginning of the war has been almost a post-office department in himself in collecting and preserving the letters of the french soldiers quotes the following letter written by a little frenchman so young as he says as hardly to be more than a child monsieur barres seems to like this letter particularly possibly because of its mention of des roulettes said ancien as the youngster calls him and of lorraine m barres is himself from lorraine and he often takes delight in writing lorraine alsace instead of the usual way as much as to the louvre or notre dame or napoleon's tomb or any of the other sites of paris tourists flock to see the statue of strasbourg in the place de la concorde always with the mourning wreaths heaped about its base which according to this little parisienne are to be changed to palms of glory letter of a wounded papa has already written me of having seen you and told you the news about me how i should like to have been in his place and told you myself for i am sure that he will have exaggerated the little i have done papa is proud of having his son wounded but he is not as proud as i am if you knew how it gave me a sensation of pain but if i can so express it of happy pain i was glad to be wounded i who dreamed so often of suffering a little for france and the thought gave me strength the will to get well as soon as possible in order to go back to rejoin my comrades who are still fighting do you know it bores me to be inactive i still have the thirst for battle i must still have my little revenge apart from the great revenge which we all are in the way of preparing how one has a good conscience and a tranquil spirit while feeling the bullets and the shells flying around one and saying to oneself it is for france 
one must be on the battlefield to see how well she is defended how all her children meet and fight with a song on their lips courage in their hearts it is so beautiful to feel this great patriotic breeze pass over you and when the tricolore is unfolded one no longer lives one runs to meet death it rushes like a hurricane past you and one finds oneself marvelling transformed one is a man one is a frenchman ah we shall soon have with us again our alsace lorraine brothers and we shall no longer go to the statue of strasbourg to place mourning wreaths there but palms of glory and of gratitude alas deroulede will be missing but it doesn't matter he knew how to make thousands of derudes the beautiful youth of france and in souvenir of this elder we have given ourselves body and soul to france god and france here is our motto the one protects us and we defend the other is it not a glorious mission and if by chance i should be left on the battlefield think of a little frenchman a little parisian who surrendered his soul happy in the thought of a greater france humphrey cobb when he was nineteen and before america entered the war humphrey cobb of new york went abroad to serve with the english army in france he was born in italy and lived there until he was fourteen although when he was nine he started going to an english school it was his feeling for his school and his friends over there that made him eager to help in the allied cause he enlisted in canada some of humphrey cobb's letters are amusingly young and some are alarmingly old in one letter he is begging for sporting sheets and baseball scores and in another is telling gravely of things perhaps no boy as kipling says of dicky hat in the pride of his youth should be expected to know humphrey cobb's letters are written to his mother almost every letter expresses a great contentment at being in the war he seems to know that the war is the big event of his generation and he writes that those who will have missed it will always be out of it in his last letter written just before starting for france he says what i would have missed if i had not enlisted the following letter was written from a training camp in england letter of humphrey cobb july seventeenth nineteen seventeen you know mother sometimes i can hardly believe that i am in england again england where every spot is historic and the whole land is beautiful england a great camp of soldiers a nation at war the heart of the world and it seems strange to think that below the horizon is glorious magnificent france and beyond her beautiful italy the land of poetry art and love good god mother what an experience this is what men i run up against and get to know what stories of roving lives i have heard what tragedies and comedies i have seen and into what lives and characters i have had a glimpse and even this is child's play to what we will see hear and experience in france thank god i have not missed it it is all big mother nothing petty or small and the greatest thing of this life is its perpetual and recurrent humor how blue we all get how happy we are how we swear how we laugh i wish you could have seen our hut this morning when the news came up that some other hut had taken our breakfast as well as theirs well i'll be damned if i'll go on parade or work if i don't get fed was about all you could hear and the funny part of it was they all went on parade the same as usual and lived through it in spite of threats to drop dead in the ranks from lack of food they won't do this and they won't do that but they always do it when the time comes one request about the end of september and the beginning of october the world series will begin that is baseball games between the leading teams of the american and national league if you can find out when they begin will you save all the sporting sheets of every day during the series but should you overlook them as your inexperience in the sporting pages might lead you to do just get the scores from some one uncle blank or uncle blank and they will tell you which came out on top and that will do just as well 
Edmund Yerbury Priestman The story of Edmund Yerbury Priestman reflects glory on the Boy Scouts. He was a young scoutmaster in Sheffield, England, who received his commission in October 1914. His letters are published under the title, With a BP Scout in Gallipoli. He died at Suvla Bay. He died defending an advanced post for which he had volunteered. It was the kind of an advanced post in which the men run forward at night with sandbags and try to dig themselves in before the enemy's guns can reach them. In this case, the Turks rushed the position. Lieutenant Priestman did not retire, but opened fire and held the enemy back for a time until a second rush when the little band was overcome. The entire lot, thirty of them, was wiped out clean as a slate. The position so heroically defended has been named Priestman's Post. Edmund Priestman was twenty-five when he was killed. His letters are boyish and full of fun, and are illustrated with his own sketches, which are clever and humorous. The spirit of the letters is indicated in the incident when two of his subalterns thought it was one of our party, and so were prepared to jeer. If the motto of the Boy Scouts is, For life or death be prepared, surely the motto for the young Englishman at war is, For life or death be prepared to jeer and be jokey. But young Priestman also had his serious moment, and a fine talent for descriptive writing, as seen in the following letter. Letter of Edmund Yerbury Priestman, A Trench, August 27, 1915 the small boy who used to try and say the twenty-third psalm all in one breath never guessed that he would ever experience what that valley really could be like, but having spent two hours in it last Saturday afternoon, he's going to try and describe his experience. You must try and imagine us at about the time many of your local knuts were leaving for the cricket ground or golf links, squatting on our haunches in a shallow and dusty trench, listening to the most appalling uproar you could dream of. Behind us our big guns are roaring, above us the shells are tearing through the air, and in front of us, all up the long valley ahead, the crash of their bursting is simply deafening. Somewhere, all too vaguely described to us, are three lines of Turkish trenches which must be taken today. Can you picture the feeling of all of us as we watch the minute hand slowly creep towards three? Ten minutes only now, now only seven, and what of us all when that hand shall have touched the half hour? The dentist's grisly waiting den, the anteroom to the operating theater, these multiplied a thousand in their dread anticipation. And now the moment has come. A whistle sounds, a scramble over the trusty parapet we have learned to know as a shield for so many hours, and the valley is before us. Whiss! Whiss! The air is full on every side with invisible death. Whiss! Foot! A bullet kicks up a little spray of dust from the dry gray earth underfoot, another and another to left and right. The sensation of terror is swallowed up in an overwhelming conviction that the only possible course is forward, forward at any cost. That is what we have been telling ourselves all through the long waiting, and that is our only clear impression now. Forward, and we instinctively bend as one does to meet a hailstorm and rush for it. Beyond the rough ploughed ground over which we are advancing lies a low thick belt of brambles and bushes. Here for a time we can lie under cover and regain our breath for a second rush. The man on my left stumbles and comes down with a crash and a groan. Only an instinctive catch of the breath and the old conviction, forward at all costs, swamps all other sensations down we go behind the kindly shelter and whiss whiss the bullets flow over us two more rushes over the open and i find only three of my men left to follow me the others are not all hit of course many have got isolated with other parties we are all wondering where on earth we are by now as we've certainly advanced quite seven hundred yards and no trench yet finally a rush takes us into a long narrow ditch where we are safe from the bullets 
dusk is falling and we are preparing to spend the night in our safe retreat when a rustling comes from up the ditch i grip my rifle and prepare for action the sound comes nearer and i challenge it friend comes the feeble reply and down the trench there crawls what was once only a few hours ago a man and now it is hard to tell the poor fellow that i can do nothing for him but he is beyond all help now and he knows it a drink of water helps matters and he lies back as comfortable as i can make him and asks quietly for a woodbine oh you splendid british tommy not even to be daunted by those hideous explosive bullets we all know so well by now there must be some power behind you that lends you who suffer courage and we who have come through the conviction that such courage can only be on the side of right and justice as night falls it is decided that i should take a message back to the brigadier to report where our party is dug in so i slip my revolver into my pocket and set out that's the whole story what we gained and lost that day form no part of it the papers will show all that some time the marseillaise allons enfants de la patrie le jour de gloire est arrivé the luckiest musical composition ever promulgated carlyle calls the marseillaise and the german poet klopstock said more when on one occasion he said to its author rouget de lille you lost us thirty thousand germans the germans in fact think so well of the marseillaise that they have always claimed that the tune at least was made in germany but we who have never heard the marseillaise when the blood runs and the flag is in danger apparently have never heard it at all it may be we americans do not know our star-spangled banner either since few of us have ever heard it when more than its top notes were in danger it was after some particularly violent fighting when the river was as red as the soldiers breeches that a young french gunner unnamed wrote the description which is quoted by monsieur victor giraud author of la troisième france published by the libraire Hachette in paris the marseillaise letter of a gunner where we were by the light of the firing we could see the battlefield very distinctly and never shall i see anything more fantastic than the thousands of red legs in close rank that charged the gray legs commenced to tremble they do not like the bayonet the marseillaise kept on and the bugle sounded the charge and our cannons kept on spitting finally our infantry closed with the enemy not a gunshot the bayonet suddenly the call to charge stopped the bugles called to the flag instinctively we stopped firing startled the marseillaise grew louder and over there further on the call to the flag continued a dead silence only the marseillaise and the bugle and we could make out the terrible conflict suddenly the bugle stopped a second time then at full blast they sounded the charge the flag was recaptured an immense uproar our guns replied all alone and the boches that night had to fly as fast as their legs could carry them you who think you know the marseillaise because you have heard it played at some prize distribution get rid of your illusion to know it it is necessary to have heard it as i have just described it to you when the blood runs and the flag is in danger donald hankey donald hankey the author of a student in arms one of the most popular of the war books is an englishman who was killed in action on the western front in october nineteen sixteen he wrote his letters originally for the london spectator mr strachey editor of the spectator says that after reading the book you cannot get away from the conclusion that man after all is a noble animal which is contrary to the pacifist assumption just a little insulting that all men are driven to war as to shambles and are necessarily brutalized by fighting for a good cause donald hankey was chiefly interested in the great democratic experiment of the war and its lasting and beneficial results after the war is over he writes with mixed humor and seriousness and always with a warm kindliness 
he writes with as much affection of the cockney warrior as of the beloved captain who was not a democrat at all but rather a justification of aristocracy on the whole he reserves his best sympathy for the cockney it takes more heroism for the cockney to be a hero than for the beloved captain tell an english public school boy of some perilous adventure and he will thrill to it and say how jolly tell the same thing to a boy in the east end of london and he will say oh i'm glad i weren't there but when he has been there he has generally been ready a student in arms is a fine tribute to the englishman in arms from whatever rank letter of donald hankey for every englishman who philosophizes there are a hundred who don't for every soldier who prays there are a thousand who don't but there is hardly a man who will not return from the war bigger than when he left home his language may have deteriorated his views on religion and morals may have remained unchanged he may be rougher in manner but it will not be for nothing that he has learnt to endure hardship without making a song about it that he has risked his life for righteousness sake that he has bound up the wounds of his mates and shared with them his meagre rations we who have served in the ranks of the first hundred thousand will want to remember something more than the ingloriousness of war we shall want to remember how adversity made men unselfish and pain found them tender and danger found them brave and loyalty made them heroic the fighting man is a very ordinary person that's granted but he has shown that the ordinary person can rise to unexpected heights of generosity and self-sacrifice end of part seven